All right, uh, here we go. We have the one and only uh, Jermaine from the Stay Out Light crew. Uh, uh, How are you doing uh, today, uh, man? Good, man. Um, <laughs> long night yesterday, but uh, felt good to be out. Felt good to, to feel like, you know, things were popping again because it's been so long, you know what I mean? Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. You know, with, you know, being from Brampton and just having like a long like legacy with the Stay Out uh, Late crew, you know, just from the music to the parties to everything else, it ha must be like an exciting journey that you had and like you already like documented, documented all of that stuff, like in interviews and everything else too. So I feel like this would be the time to create it more in the general aspect of the lens of Yashu show and all that, you know? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, but before we get into like the very like specifics, like I know everything's already documented from past interviews and past songs and everything else too, but I want to get like those special moments that you had in life too. So you grew up in uh, Brampton, uh, correct? Yeah. So what was like the environment like for you growing up in Brampton? Would you say that it was like a good experience like growing up or would you say that it was like, quite different in a way? I feel like... Um Brampton is a special place uh, because of how everybody kind of ended up there. You know what I mean? Like it was a lot of people who like experienced like the first parts of gentrification and came from different parts of Toronto to Brampton, and there was just like a lot of mix of people. When I was growing up, it was more white than anything, and then it kind of progressed into being. Uh, more of a South Asian community than anything. Um, but me personally, I feel like it was, it was dope. Like, growing up in the suburbs, you get a lot of time to nurture who you are and kind of like reflect on what you desire in life in general. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, I feel like when you're in the city, everything is so fast paced and everybody's always asking something from you for whatever the case would be. So it's like, you don't find a lot of that peace. And like, to me, Brampton gave me a lot of time and peace and, and just space to be able to become the person that I want to become, you know what I mean? No doubt, no doubt. And you know, you already like documented it from the time like when you started out like making music and you know having these like family-based parties playing sports in school to high school where you formed like, the stay out late crew and then it became like a ph uh, phenomenon like within the community too and like it was like very evident with you know doing freestyles at like burger joints to like even like throwing these house parties too and then you kind of had to like expand it for a bit like when you moved to Toronto so when you moved to Toronto um, to expand your career, uh, did you feel that like living in the city had a better experience for you in terms of like opportunities and like environments and so forth, or do you feel that both like Toronto and Brampton have like a lot of like similarities like in terms of opportunity and like environments and that type of stuff? Definitely not. Um, <laughs> Toronto, by far, in terms of being able to give you opportunity. Uh, relationships and just like the, the all the tools that you need to kind of get to that next step in your in your career as like an artist is like bar none you know what I mean with the advancement of the internet I feel like a lot of that has changed so much where like now you can gain a lot of that access or whatever from your home wherever you are whether that's Brampton or Pickering or wherever um, so I feel like that progression is super dope but I still feel like there's so much value in being in the city and and gaining that experience and, and being able to, to uh, refine the personality that you are as an artist you know what I mean like a lot of people aren't comfortable in front of a camera a lot of people haven't perform to a crazy large audience and you get all that from here you get like the festivals where there's like five to ten thousand people in the audience and you get like the freaking uh, i don't know just like the, the camera is always in your face people like yourself and 
whatnot who are dedicated to being that person who's documenting everything and like that shit is invaluable like there's so much shit that exists about me on the internet that i'm able to look at and that like fans new and old are able to kind of look at to build the story of who i am and like appreciate everything that i've done as an artist and like that it's like irreplaceable you know from the start of your career until now like there has been like a lot of changes with everything so far so do you feel like that you have grown as creative and entrepreneur from the start of your career until now in terms of the way you made your products your music and you know networking to like everything else now like blowing up for you and all that 100 man like i think it's it's crazy to reflect on where i started to where i'm at now and just to kind of like think about how much you can learn from being in this industry because it's like you don't really know what it is until you're in it you know what i'm saying and it's like when you start learning other people's stories and you're like oh shoot like your dad was an artist and your aunt your grandmother was an artist and da da da, da and you you learn that so many people have just like it's like a birthright to them you know what i'm saying or there's just like the people who are like yo they were able to just like bankroll it or whatever but like for my story, it, I'm the only person from my family who's ever pursued this. I had a, a, a cousin who passed away uh, when he, when I was like 14, who was like the person who kind of inspired me to push for it. But like my family's uh, like we're worker bees, you know what I mean? Like very working class, very like get the job, buy the house, have the kid, da 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 da. And I was the first person that's like I don't. I don't want to do that. I want to pursue something in arts and entertainment. You know what I mean? That you learn so much in regard to like connects and how much work you have to do, and how it just never stops. It's an ongoing process. But I feel like it, there's also a crazy level of independence and something that allows you to be able to to see everything else in that same light, so that your soul self sufficient you know what i mean like i don't know music's really changed my life in a million ways that i can never really explain in a simple interview it's going to be something that kind of like plays out in a million interviews but there's been a ton of growth to answer your question yeah yeah for sure and you know it's been evident from like you know the group's like first song from 2014 or like 2013 or like even stuff back in like the early 2010s when you guys were starting out to even now with like this new single called like lavish you know with charlie with everyone else too like uh, on the uh, song uh, too uh, uh, so shout out the gang charlie noir sky div young wolf you know <laughs> and you know lavish you know i saw the music video and it was like very unique in that sense too like it had like more of like a dark type vibe with the nightlife and everything else you know you know mid like pandemic so tell me more about that and uh what was like the creative process for that song and the inspiration for it based on like the group's idea and such um so that song was a part of a bunch of songs that happened when we took honestly our first ever like writing retreat together as like a squad um to to make a short question long basically stay out late has gone through a bunch of different like identities or generations you know what i mean like we've had a lot of members come and go and there's been a lot of growing pains but i feel like we within the last two years have picked up charlie noir and young wolf and kind of learned how things need to go to be able to continue to grow and progress to the places that we want to be and when you have people that get it and you're all like-minded you start just kind of like clicking and ideas start making so much more sense and they're so much easier to execute so we went out we did a writing retreat for the first time and banged out i think like 12 songs in the, on the retreat we came back, uh, we got them like mixed, mastered, and then that became the project that we're dropping a little bit later this year called Fabergé. 
um, but Lavish was one of those songs and it was just like I don't know it was just like an instant vibe an instant feeling and it kind of just progressed into the video and the idea came from uh, one of the managers on Stay Out Late uh, Jay Parks uh, and Scotty IV who kind of like came up with the treatment of it but we've always been really dedicated to showing people what we feel Toronto is you know what I mean so that was kind of like the thing that we set out to do I mean but you'll see that you see that in most of the videos that we do like in uh, one of my old songs City Lights we did the same thing where we set it up where it's just like you see the real Toronto you know what I mean you see the the Drake hotels you see you know Lakeshore you see uh, you know the places that man's are chilling the pizza spot the da 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 that hasty market that no longer exists because of gentrification but <laughs> you see all that stuff and I feel like that's something that is extremely valuable because we I don't know uh, this came up um, recently when Drake dropped his like uh, one of his most recent videos of uh, what, what, what happened next or whatever I think it wants to actually yeah what's next and he's in Toronto and he's hitting like he's on the streetcar or the subway and he's like by Young and Dundas or whatever and everybody's like he's the only person that's showing Toronto and we, like, we're sitting back like what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But I mean all in due time, the more people that see it, the more people will realize what we're doing, you know? Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And you know it's crazy how like that music video was made during a time like when the Toronto like nightlife scene is dead and I think by the time like the mid March 2020 happened, everything just came to like a certain end, you know, because you can't have clubs anymore, you can't have shows, yeah. you can't have everything like that, which kind of sort of like destroyed the nightlife scene, like the hearts and lungs of it in that sense too. So, do you feel that the pandemic has tarnished the heart and lungs of the entertainment and nightlife scene in Toronto? And like even like when the post-pandemic like starts do you feel like it can make a comeback the never so i avoided this question or I, I avoided saying this at the beginning of the interview i was being just like i don't know it's weird everybody feels a different way about like where we're at with the pandemic or whatever but like last night i was at a rave there was like 400 people at the fucking rave and it was just in a park in the east of toronto you know what i mean yeah. and it was crazy because that question I feel like is what everybody's been asking like will shit be the same when, sh when, it, when things come back and that experience to me by far says that like it, the nightlife is still here you know people still want it obviously like there's a younger generation coming in there that are dying to party and I feel like everybody's had so much time to grow that I feel like it's going to be insane. I feel like people are, it's going to be a thousand times doper than it was. And it's not going to exist within the confines of, of what it was before. It's not only going to be bars and, and clubs and, and venues that you see the illest shit happening. You're going to see shit happening everywhere. You know what I mean? Like people don't care. It's like, yo, where, where's the party? What, what? Like, where's the performance? Oh, we're going to the park? Bet. Like, find the speakers, find the mic, da -da, let's get it. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's going to be crazy. I feel like some of the illest artists, some of the illest parties, some of the illest shows, and some of the illest content ever is going to come when we're back. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. You know, one thing that was actually like very crazy to me was how the formation of media has also changed too with bloggers and podcasts and other people having the shine than like the traditional like media and all that so like in terms of like seeing like very like unique radio stations that were popular back then like flow 93.5 and g98.7 you know who were the staples at that time too now it's like you know we love hip-hop and all these like other toronto based blogs like even like uh, this uh, platform too like yeah, that's kind of um, making up so like even like with digital like streaming platforms you know that are like spotify and like soundcloud and apple music social media non-broadcast media outlets being more of the current outlook for the rise 
in these artists' careers and brands? Do you feel that the ma the radio and magazine era is coming to a certain end for being the traditional outlet for artists, or do you think that they could adapt like easily in like this modern world? Um, I'm a huge fan of independent magazines. Um, and I feel like that's been a conversation in the world of magazines for probably like the last decade. You know what I mean? Like our generation, I feel like didn't really come up other than like Vice, our generation didn't really come up with the same idea of what a magazine was as like our parents and shit. Um, but I took a trip to the UK and when I was there, I kind of like, you know, you go into a store to get like water or whatever and you kind of like look at how they display the magazines or whatnot and the content that's inside of it and how much space they've given to magazines to exist in a space where it's, it's almost more art than anything else, you know what I mean? And I think that's with the direction of where things like more so magazines, less radio, but I feel like radio will also exist just for the fact that like Again, it's it's an, a form of media that like is always going to give you something that you won't get from other places, you know what I mean? And I feel like that's the space that is going to be carved out for those platforms, you know what I mean? Where people are going to be able to get these like very intimate and exclusive moments. So it's not going to be like a powerhouse, it's not going to be crazy, it's not going to be like everybody in the world knows about it, it's really going to be this like niche but I feel like possibly beautiful thing that a lot of people are going to appreciate way more than they did before you know what I mean yeah no doubt and with even like zines too like zines are still like the biggest thing now um in certain aspects too um like online blogs too and you know crazy even like they're turning it into some magazines too as well which is actually quite interesting so it gives it more of like an outlet for others who might not have that access to and then like even like independent like radio stations too um there's still some people listening to like college like radio as well and hell yeah even like double xl you know people are still buying covers you know even for the double xl freshman everything like that so. hell yeah i mean like i i think that's dope as well because like when you look at things like the double xl freshman is it's now a collector's item people have it because it's like yo i want that framed in my in my house or whatever the case may be yeah. and then uh, yeah it's it's, it's dope I think this has to be like one of the most ideal questions that I think no one really talks about and it's uh, gatekeeper culture so in every other in every other city every other like industry and genre or brand there's gatekeeping in many aspects whether it's at like k-pop whether it's you know rap whether it's clothing everything like that too and you know Toronto like Sometimes you might find out if there is a gatekeeper culture or not because there's some people that are recluded to certain scenes. And, you know, like in your opinion, do you feel that Toronto has a gatekeeper culture? And what are your thoughts on it in a sense? I feel like everywhere has a gatekeeper culture. And I think it's funny because I've probably spoken publicly about this a number of times on like my Instagram and stuff, but it's like if you look back and you were and you see a lot of the shit that I say it comes from being outside you know what I mean but when it comes down to it I feel like I've begun to understand what like the gatekeeper culture is and it's a fine line you know what I mean it's like if you have a million dollars and you know, everybody's coming up to you and they're like, yo, let me let me borrow a thousand dollars. Let me the, it you don't just give it to everybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's like I want to know, I right, first of all, if I give you this thousand dollars, are you giving it back? Like is this a loan? You know what I mean? Or like what are you gonna do with it? Like are you going to benefit the community? Um, you know what I mean? Or what, are you just gonna blow it on a pair of Yeezys? You know what I'm saying? Like I feel like all those things are the same as what gatekeeper culture does for a lot of people because it's like at the end of the day it's a bunch of people who have worked very hard to build whatever they built whether for whatever reason you know what I mean like we can argue you know privilege or whatever the case may be but like 
you're in a position and your desire for that position is for it to be a reflection of what you've created, of what you've done. So it's like, I feel like a lot of people perceive gatekeeper culture as this thing where it's like, um, they're not being treated fairly, but it's really to me, at the point that I'm at now, just something that has a lot to do with paying dues. I say all that to also understand and know that like, obviously there's a lot of like messed up things that happen within that space that we've been dealing with a lot. Like when you look at like the Me Too movement, when you look at like, obviously like Black Lives Matter and stuff like that, where we realize that like those small things like, you know, white privilege and, you know, male privilege and stuff like that are things that I love that have been changing but I don't think gatekeeper culture in general is ever going to go away. It's just going to be a consistently refined thing that people are always going to have like a little bit of a qualm with, you know? No doubt. And it's actually very interesting too, like even like when discussing about, you know, the Me Too movement and, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, like these two questions, I think um, these are very like one of the most sensitive topics that we could even like talk about, especially within Toronto. So I want to get to one of them first because it's quite shorter. Um, 2018, like I think um, sometime in 2018, a Toronto Instagram page by Toronto abusers like was made exposing, you know, the people accused of either abuse, rape, or any other type of thing too, which then got deleted a while back or like was not like active in that sense. And then it became bigger throughout like years later on too, which affected like many people like in these industries too and uh, I don't want to say like the names of everyone that was accused of but like one person who was you know in the limelight was Langston Francis like the person signed to Sony Music and you know even with you like being in this industry being like a male like artist who was also like an entrepreneur and who has a, a high reputation in all these other in- industries too, within Toronto, within the nightlife, and everything else too. Um, you know, just to get your thoughts on this whole Me Too movement and abuser shaming in the creative arts industry, in your opinion, do you feel that it has been prevalent in, to me- in Toronto's music scene and as well as for the impact it made? And what are your thoughts on it? Um, like I was saying before, I think it's it's a great thing. I feel like it's creating space for accountability, you know? Um, And it's creating space for everybody to to just be better humans in general, you know what I'm saying? Like, the nightlife is is fucked up. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, there's drugs, there's drinking, there's fucking anything that you can imagine going on and it's something that I feel like has existed in this gray area for a long while. And as I was saying before, it is something that uh, in terms of like the gatekeeper situation, people use it to their advantage. Like, oh, you want this job? You gotta sleep with me, with me. you know what I mean? You, you wanna do this, do that. Like, you wanna get here, get there. That that's something that has to happen or just kind of like, you know, shaming people because you have that spotlight or that power and you feel like nobody's going to listen to somebody who's like, who's a lesser than, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're in a place where that's being addressed and that men have to be men about their situations, you know what I mean? Like, if you don't got game enough to talk to a, a, a lady to be able to be with her, just leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. And, you know, there's, like, other opportunities as well, like, aside from, you know, using your power to, like, cause harm, you know, there's other outlets where you don't have to actually go in that route. And, you know, I don't want to say it, you know, for demonetization, but, you know, like, there's other ways that you, you can cope with it. You know, sometimes you can just hang out with other people. Sometimes there's other girls to talk to who's interested too. And, Yeah, you know, I mean, every day, like, I mean, it's it's also something that has to do with power. Like, yeah. once you gain a certain amount of power, you have to deal with 
what that brings out of you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and that's kind of like the same thing that I was talking about before when we were talking about growing up in, in Brampton is that like, I did have a lot of time to reflect on these things as I saw them. You know what I mean? Like, people being accused of like rape or whatever the case may be is a new racism is a new like none of these things are, are new it's just if you've taken the time to really like reflect on what it means and not brush it to the side you know what i'm saying and i think it's it's valuable that people have to decide how they feel about these things now because it's honestly fucked up that in 2021 this is still something that we have to deal with you know, it, it's I feel like people should have progressed beyond that like it's not hard make a decision <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> no doubt no doubt and very informative as well um, you know being a person who's more active on Instagram and Twitter you know whether it's through Stay Out Late or through like your own page as well Especially with this era where, with the deaths of like George Floyd and Regis Korshinsky Paquette, um, a lot of people like in Toronto, especially people from the black community, talked about the issues on Twitter with racism, with the nightlife establishments, you know, with accusations from employees from the Cactus Club, uh, Lavelle in some cases too, and re well, a while back, uh, the, the Drake Hotel in which you've done your work at as well and then yeah. in like with EFS um, what are your thoughts on that situation being someone who is highly active in, in the entertainment scene either as like an entrepreneur a host um, a person promoting the event and everything else too um, do you feel like as you said like, do you feel that racism is a huge problem in the nightlife scene in Toronto um, yeah I feel like racism is a huge problem in nightlife is general in general because it's it's we're coming from generations and generations of fucking white people owning the clubs that we perform at and the music venues that we perform at and the bars that we do parties at or whatever the case may be so it's like we've always been the people who have been in my opinion more so in a position of the entertainer not the owner and again, it, it falls back to people having to deal with shit or like actually make a decision as to how they feel about shit. Like if you're a fucking racist, you're a racist, <laughs> you know what I mean? And if nobody calls you out, then you'll continue to act and operate in a way where you feel like you never have to address it. But then when you're actually called out, you gotta address it, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and like when that time comes, you gotta make a decision. And I am aware now that we've been like a year out of, you know, uh, the, the Blackout Tuesday situation, that a lot of people were able to like go online, throw up a black square, like you have a business, throw up a black square, and you think that that's it. You're like, ah, we're safe now. We throw up a black square, nobody's gonna think we're racist. <laughs> but you're still racist. And if you don't deal with it, it's gonna come back and bite you in the ass. Cause like, I love the Drake and I've had nothing but great experiences but if I know that that's the way that something is operating or that that exists in that space I'm not gonna feel comfortable continuing to do business because I know that I can do business in a million other places like I said I was just at a rave yesterday in a park you don't need your venues no more so if you're racist <laughs> <laughs> if you're racist like we'll figure out ways to work around you and when the money doesn't come, the well dries up, you have to close down, and then we'll buy your spot for $12. <laughs> so, that's how I feel, you know? Well said, you know, and I think that's very informative, and I think that even, like, ta like targets, like, the next question, too. Like, you've already said men should be held, like, accountable, that these businesses should be held, like, accountable, too, um, and everything else as well. Um, just with, like, other ideas and other improvements, um, in order to stop like racism and even like predatory behavior in these like establishments, um, what do you think should be implemented more so that certain groups can become more comfortable like interacting in these scenes again? Do you feel like more training for the employees should uh, be beneficial? Like more security checks to, to detect uh, like predatory behavior or anything else like that? Um, 
I was chilling with a friend a couple days back. We were like we linked up and we were just playing basketball in the morning, and we had like a little bit of a conversation in this regard. Um, we were kind of just like reflecting on something as simple as how we would react two years ago if we saw something sexist or racist happening as opposed to how we would react now and both of us looking at each other and being like, yeah, we wouldn't hesitate now. Like I feel like people feel a lot more obligated to be like, or empowered to be like, I see it, I know it's wrong, let me address it. And I feel like that's going to be the thing that changes everything. So we don't need the companies to change because if it's it's basically either you change or, you, or you're fucked. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Because I feel like everybody's going to not hesitate to call that shit out right away. So I feel like the power is, is in us now. Like we're, it's it's kind of like inevitable. Yeah, like was, like was. Um, kind of like the same thing too. I think I totally agree with what you said too. And I think just even like with more checks, with um, analyzing the behavior of others, you know, like knowing what to do to not stop these setbacks. You know, these are like very great ideas as well. Um, and just to end off uh, the interview, um, do you have any other like plans for this year in terms? Of any music, other creative projects, or anything else, and a lot of, a lot of big things happening that I can't fully say, but they're pretty friggin' huge. Um, but one thing that I can say is that you are getting a Stay Out Late Collective project this year, very very soon, um, and you are getting a lot of solo music from the camp from charlie noir from scotty iv from young wolf very very soon and um yeah it's, it's gonna be friggin insane i'm i'm i've been i'm the most excited i've ever been about where i'm at in my career as an artist and i just hope that everybody continues to follow the journey because it's gonna be nuts and I'm definitely gonna come back and have to talk to Yashu a million times about it. We're gonna have beer fucking interviews. It's gonna be like, <laughs> it's yeah. gonna be like Jay and fucking, I don't know who does all Jay's interviews, you know what I mean? Like Elliot. Yeah. It's gonna be crazy, but yeah, yeah 100% stay locked into Lens of Yashu and yeah, with Polly took with Polly, but keep an eye out for that new Stay Out Late album coming and everything that's coming next. Thank you for having me. No problem. Shmaina, uh, thank you for coming by and hopefully we could have like another one with the Stay Out Late crew with Charlie, with Scotty, with Hell yeah. everyone Hell else yeah. too and you know, until next time. Peace. Peace.